All right. Uh, the at the G1 uh, conference, the normally we I'm not sup, uh, supposed to introduce the too much in detail about the panelists, but uh, uh, important. You are very lucky that you have chosen this session today uh, for this uh, time slot. Uh, the Mr. Chadley is a CG Group Global Head. Uh, he's a kind of a, a remarkable leader in in uh, Nepal. Uh, in a conglomerate, the the type of uh, the organization, I would say, so uh, it's a great great opportunity for you to to for here for you to listen to him. The uh, Mr. Gan Hu Yang, uh, I call him Gan. <laughs> um, the, he is a former vice minister of finance of uh, Mongolia. He's now at the private sector, but uh, having these uh, uh, political leadership at. And uh, private leadership, it's, again, it's going to be uh, very interesting to listen to him. Uh, last but not the least, Dr. Bachala. He is a chairman of German Emeritus, as uh, it was uh, explained. But he is also a former trade minister, like a USTR, uh, minister of Thailand. So uh, again, there's a very many uh, mixed uh, the perspective uh, you can enjoy listening to these uh, panelists. Having said this, I'd like to start with uh, um, so-called frontier market. Uh, the, I have to say there is no clear definition what is a frontier market. Uh, everyone, I think we understand what is so-called emerging market or BRICS, the Brazil, India, Russia, China, South Africa. So BRICS is called emerging market. Then the, everybody is watching very much about those markets. But uh, since there, some of those are slowing down, and we started to also watch what is next step, what is next uh, 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 commas, uh, coming up uh, as, uh, like uh, new dragons or new tigers or whatever, uh, wolf or something like this. So uh, the frontier market beyond current uh, emerging market could be the one that we talk about. So we like to have a series of opinions. But first of all, I like to ask uh, all panelists uh, to draw or to speak about their opinion, your opinion about current emerging market. How you view the BRICS or a so-called emerging market from your point of view? Dr. Chaldini, please. Me. Yes, yes, please. Uh, greetings from Nepal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yarate. I truly appreciate uh, you are moderating the session and giving me the opportunity to share my perspective. Well, being flanked by two of the four nations of the BRICS, that is China and India, I can certainly share my perspective. You know. <laughs> it's not without uh, big opportunity, but sometimes challenges are not as simple. Hadn't that been the case, perhaps the South Asia you know, and Nepal, including India, happens to be a part of the South Asian, um, so to say, the economic blocking would not have been one of the poorest example of any economic reason in the world. You know, politics often overtakes business. That's what we've seen. I mean, we share 1,800 kilometers long border with India. Historic, typically speaking, it doesn't require too much of common sense to say that, look, it's a huge market. It's one of the emerging markets, you know. The whole world is trying, eyeing India. They want to be in India. But if you look at our trade imbalance with India or a balance of payment situation, is precarious. The situation is similar between India and China, too. So it's not hunky-dory, and we've already been seen that there are problems in most of these countries, you know. The global focus is in these countries. The internal situation in some of these countries, I, I, I can talk about India, you know, it's far away from what it is seen from outside. The weakening currencies makes it even more difficult. So I think uh, that, that's probably the reason why our subject of today, the frontiers, becomes far more relevant. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, I'd love to hear others' perspective. Thank you. Okay. 
Gang, could you provide your view with, about the current emerging market? How you see it? Well, uh, first I must admit, you know, the, it uh, depends. Uh, the, the definition of the emerging market depends where you stand. For me, the emerging market is Japan because I come from Mongolia, and of course, you know, Mongolia has just opened up uh, Japan 25 years ago. 15 years ago, we started dominating the sumo, and now we want to. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, sorry, we discovered Japan 800 years ago. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't quite get there, but uh, it depends on the perspective in uh, where you stand and when you stand. Yeah? Uh, right now, we want to export to Japan uh, Kashmir, meat, uh, coal. Maybe there is partnerships that we can look at uh, in the energy sector. But my friend here, Sergalen, is doing the joint venture with the Japanese to uh, import the Japanese teachers from Kosen. You know, there is a technical uh, high schools. And uh, he brings about 10 professors who have been uh, displaced because of, uh, with the help of Sasaka uh, Foundation, yes. Um, uh, uh, because of the age or because there is no more demand for technical education in, in Japan. So we bring them to Mongolia and we give them jobs. Um, in terms of, uh, 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 you know, you were describing China as a, and, uh, and India as a sandwich, and Mongolia is, uh, is you know, sandwiched between <laughs> Russia and China. And uh, I think uh, uh, it is a bit uh, more precarious situation that we're in, yeah? Okay. <laughs> uh, but it gives a very good opportunity to us also uh, because we have our third neighbor policy and uh, we view Japan as our third neighbor. That's why we signed last year with the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe a strategic partnership agreement on our economy. And I think uh, this gives us uh, hope that uh, we will discover Japan and maybe Japan will discover Mongolia. And uh, I take uh, on uh, Binot's uh, point, but I don't look at, uh, now I was thinking, you know, Nepal and Mongolia actually, uh, uh, we always look at us as a ham in the sandwich. But maybe we are bread. We sandwich and squeeze between us the China, you know. So let's take it from both sides. <laughs> OK. All right. So next, uh, Dr. Bachana from Thailand. I think the words like emerging or frontiers are kind of coined by economists or financiers so they can uh, do business in a more systematic way. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but emerging came some years ago. And of course, we talk about BRICS. And look what BRICS are doing now, um, not too well. So really, there's a cyclical things going on. Um, also, Thailand is a part of ASEAN, but a part of emerging markets as well. Actually, for ASEAN uh, countries, the founding uh, countries, uh, including even Philippines, Malaysia, or Indonesia, also in the top 20 of the emerging markets. But yet again, there are new countries or countries which, which start to be uh, enjoying or exposing it themselves into the global picture. And, um, um, and frontier markets, the word themselves, are not necessarily inclu inclusive for Asia. It could be um, countries in Africa, like Kenya. In Asia, my, my understanding would be countries like Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and can be more. Uh, we to, it's not a clear definition term, but could be, uh, I would like to um, define it as a country with uh, uh, start to grow with a very good potential and with a lot of opportunity. I think Asia is a continent that now Westerners are looking at us as a, a, the room to grow. Because in Europe or in the US, you see um, they are quite stagnant now. They have to look um, outwards to, to find opportunity. And the word growth is also very important because it means you still have room to really prosper. Um, can't just talk about there's no more job for the technical professors here because Japan has up, been up to the level high enough that uh, uh, you don't really need to develop in that part anymore. Um, and then there are countries which can be used and still up and running. So those things are a, a member of the, our big global families. So I think the frontier means opportunity and growth in, in my mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
The, I think uh, uh, we are sitting in the Asian territory. Uh, the, we are very much focusing on people. Uh, the, we are coming from uh, the, uh, the Buddhism or Hindu or these uh, very peaceful, but at the same time, very educational uh, environment. And uh, people learn from that and the people stay peaceful. And uh, Japan, uh, in the recent decades, uh, we try to uh, cooperate with Asian countries, uh, try to, uh, let's say, transfer some technical knowledge or way that we, we are industri industrialized and so on. So uh, probably the Thailand is uh, way ahead now among all the uh, panelists at this time. The, from your experience, the, as probably a former minister of uh, commerce or trade minister, the, what uh, Thailand experienced in the past decade, uh, probably the good things that Thailand achieved, and maybe some uh, negative experience, which uh, probably Nepal or Mongolia or other frontier markets should not uh, apply. <laughs> maybe you have suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Sang. Uh, well, you win some, you lose some. Um, Thailand and Japan have been enjoying a very, very good relationships uh, for over one century. My family also is a partner and joint venture with Mitsubishi Automobiles, Mitsubishi Motors. So we know Japan very well and we appreciate all the help. Um, decades ago, when Japan is also growing and uh, expanding into Southeast Asia, they, they bring out the uh, technology, the know-how, and and so-called the, the word technology transfer was very much used there. Then be, uh, relying on the, uh, the um, labor force, which Japan doesn't have enough, then uh, be, they start to grow in workforce, in production, and in market. And that, that makes uh, ASEAN, uh, perhaps uh, Japan is the number one partner in terms of trade and investment uh, uh, for, for ASEAN. ASEAN is, is a 10 countries in our region. And then, uh, of course, uh, there are turbulence, uh, ups and downs. Economy cannot grow all the time, but we've been partnered for so long. Uh, now, now comes a time that uh, also most countries are export-led. Um, and because we rely on the export more than half, actually two-thirds of the uh, GDP is export. So when uh, economy in, in China affected, or U.S. Uh, market or EU market uh, effect affected, then also it really put a blow or some kind of impact to the, uh, the general economy of that country. So even in, in the morning, I was watching the news, even Germany, which is a top country, also is export led So the uh, problem in China really, it's not a China's domestic problem, it's a global problem. And we're here to really live together, to learn to you know, improve together. For, for Southeast Asia, we've been also in the emerging markets uh, status. And also, we are, are grouping ourselves as, as a um, ASEAN now. Uh, starting from the end of this year, it will become a one single market called AEC, ASEAN Economic Corporation, very much like EU, but we don't have euro. We still use our um, uh, currency. And we don't have one single language. We also use English as a so-called working language. But of course, each nation has, has its own uh, language. So I, I think, uh, looking, reflecting like Hila uh, Tesang mentioned, uh, we are looking back as us, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we pr probably are uh, so-called frontier economy or frontier market as well, and also room to grow. But now, 2015 is not like 1990. The way to grow, the method to grow, uh, judging from all the factors, variable, and all the things that you can control as well. Uh, the way to approach frontier markets give you a lot of opportunities because there are shortage of things like um, um, the need for the, uh, the energy, for the uh, consumer goods, and also with uh, the uh, great opportunity to trade as also. But the environment will not be the same. So I think uh, that we have to keep in mind. A um, little bit furthermore, the, uh, to my memory, I think 180 billion Thai bahts, uh foreign direct investment into 
Thailand. I think Japan took uh, nearly 30%, 29%, 30% of such. I think the largest investor directly the foreign investment into Thailand in a decade. So uh, how how do you do you believe the how Japan felt uh, comfortable to invest into Thailand? Thank you. Uh, currently at the Japan Chamber of Commerce of Thailand, um, there are altogether 1,800 Japanese companies registered as members. So I think that and your Japanese embassy in Bangkok is the third largest in the world in terms of number of personnel working. I think number one is Washington, maybe. Mm -hmm. And second one, I heard from the ambassador is Cairo. Cairo. Oh. I heard, but I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> he just told me. But, but number three, in the top three always, is Bangkok. And all the organizations related to embassies, like JBIC, JICA, and all, all, all the J's are there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, you, you're right. And investment is very important because Actually, I define business into four terms, trade, investment, capital, and human resources. Investment of trade, we can do import, export. You can sell and buy goods uh, without leaving the country, without just, you know, it's just a push button and so on. But investment means you really must believe in that country or believe in that location to really put your money or your uh, in, over there. But uh, Japan and Thailand have moved into another step, uh, capital. As I mentioned, almost 2,000 companies are registered there. And like, like in my joint venture with Mitsubishi, we produce 200,000 units of Mitsubishi every year, and more than half is export. Uh, to around. And that is capital stage. But you mean, it means really you have to really believe and have faith in that one. And human resources, exchange of human resources, exchange of personnel are there. Uh, in ASEAN now, um, from this year, seven professions will be moved cross-border free. Those, those professions are medical doctors, architects, accountants, engineers, and so on. Seven professions can work in another country in ASEAN as if they were working in their own country. So those are things which are, are promising the change of, of the global economy and global of the world now. Thank you. All right. Um, the, uh, to my also memory, the, if I take another example in uh, mainland China, in the past decade, the foreign direct investment amount coming from foreign countries into China, uh, this amount grow, grew uh, rapidly. Uh, but that was com nearly perfectly correlated with uh, GDP growth of China. So foreign direct investment into such country is very important for that country to grow. So uh, I think for frontier market, it is uh, very much essential uh, that to attract the foreign countries like uh, Japan, Germany, uh, coming into uh, Mongolia, Nepal, uh, that would be win-win for investors and also the countries in, in a so-called frontier market to grow. So, uh, but uh, there is also risk uh, things about it. Maybe uh, uh, could you uh, explain a little bit about the country situation as a startup, uh, how your country looks like? Start with Nepal. Well, a uh, little bit about relationship with Japan. You know, Japan, we've always enjoyed a very, very special relationship. There is great uh, affinity and affection at the people-to-people -people level. Even on a personal front, I always call Japan my B school, business school. I started a business with Japan back in 73. We did business with Machusita. We took Suzuki to Nepal even before Suzuki went to India in form of Maruti, you know. But as life slowly moved on in terms of for in terms of our trading relationship, investment relationship, things started to move on from Japan to Korea and to later to Vietnam and the other, you know, emerging market. Today, Japan continues to remain. Uh, one of the very important donor country, we, which we value a lot. Great uh, uh, background, historical background in terms of our spiritual relationship. Kenjo Thange designed the Lumbini, the birthplace of Buddha, which is so precious to, I guess, most Japanese and, of course, to all the countries who are sitting here. And, uh, and the Japanese continue to uh, love Nepal.
But on the business side, on the FDI side, I must admit that it's declining. Oh. I'd like to see much greater investment, you know, and, and I, th I think that's where I'd like to connect the question you, re you raised about the risks and rewards. Mm. Okay, Nepal, I mean, has gone through a series of political changes, as you know. And Nepal has come into the news for many unfortunate reasons over the last decades. But despite, I think Nepal has moved on economically. You know, today Nepal gets more than $6 billion in terms of foreign remittances, which is two times bigger than the national budget, so to speak. You know, we, the country's uh, grown, even during the time of political turmoil, at about 5% per annum. I mean, there have been good years when we've done exceedingly well, too. I mean, of course, our major trade is with India and China today, and they are the major investors. You know, I've always felt like we are active as a group, personally, in 30 countries, and out of them, nine are the frontiers mm -hmm. countries, as ranked by uh, IFC, OK? Just to sh supplement the information shared by my colleague here uh, on what is the global understanding, perception about the frontier. It is, I mean, there are different definitions, but probably a common definition is it is below emerging and better than LDC. Okay, there are countries, uh, very high growth countries in Middle East, which form a part of uh, emerging, uh, uh, part of frontiers, like the UAE, Bahrain, and Kuwait. Countries like Nigeria and Kenya form part of frontiers. Mm -hmm. And East European, erstwhile East European countries like Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, they are considered to be part of frontiers. And in Argentina, not Brazil, Argentina is considered to be part of. In, in South Asia, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka are the two countries which feature, not even uh, Pakistan. All so right. it's not about, uh, so, so my point is that these countries, the, even the LDCs, it's, it's all a question of the balance, drawing a, striking a balance between reward and risks. I think even the LDCs, they offer huge first mover advantages, the kind of success stories that I can talk about, whether it is Stanchart or Dabur or Liver, in Nepal, if you go and visit their website, you will never see that the kind of dividend which they've been able to earn, even in a country like Nepal, which has always remained in problem, is unprecedented, is incomparable to any other country in the world. But same times, yes, are we a very politically, a very stable country? No. Are we corruption free? No. Is it predictable, predictable in terms of your policies and implementation of the policies? No. But you've got to manage the environment. You have uh, 26 million people as a population, yeah. which is uh, rather Out of which six, big. we believe, are in all over the world. <laughs> and uh, I also hear the uh, Nepal people uh, living in Japan is rapidly increasing. That's right. There are currently over 30,000 people yeah. are living in Japan. Mm -hmm. How do you think? Great. I think the Nepalese are doing very well here particularly in the food and beverage space. I met a young man yesterday who took me to one of his restaurants called Sapna, which is dream in Nepalese language. Okay, he runs 20 restaurants. He came here 20 years ago as a student, from Japanese to Thai to Indian to Nepalese. I think Nepalese people are trusted. I think they're hardworking. They can mingle very well with the Japanese, Japanese texture in terms of body, looks, and. <coughs> You know, they speak great Japanese language. So I think it's, a, it's, it's growing, and I think they're adding, they adding a huge, uh, from in their own limited way, to the economy of this country. And I'd like to see more Japanese come to Japan. I think one of the reasons, you know, I was listening to the, at the opening, ceremony, uh, opening uh, session downstairs, and there was a question raised that what Japan needs to do in order to enhance FDI, it needs to bring the cost of management, it needs to bring the cost of manpower down. And one of the, the ways to do that is to make it liberal, open it. 
I think Japan can afford to do it. Japan has a huge advantage of being, make, being the cost of capital so low. You don't get capital for less than a percentage anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. You should use the Nepalese manpower and Japanese, China, Japanese money <laughs> and, and enter frontier markets. Hopefully not that only money. That should be money. the mantra. <laughs> All right. OK, uh, maybe again, the, uh, uh, I'd like you to speak about the first a little bit more about Mongolia as a kind of a opportunity, very, very close. As, I, as you said, the small restaurants dominate <laughs> in Tokyo or in Japan. The, we feel very close uh, the Mongolia country is. The, uh, actually, uh, in 1990, when the, uh, your political system changed from uh, socialism to a uh, democratic uh, country, uh, I think the country started to open up to the world and started to grow very rapidly. And uh, Japan has been one of the major uh, kind of assisting country for Mongolians' growth, uh, which I'm very happy to hear. The, how do you think about uh, the country itself? Maybe uh, you can explain a little bit more in depth and uh, future prospect, how your country looks like. Well, um, Mongolia is, um, is a large country. It's the 19th largest uh, land mass in the world. We used to be number one landmass in the world. Uh, 19th, you know. We, you you last, came to last Japan as well. Last 100 years have not been good, you know. Um, so we continuously slide it back. Uh, but we're getting there, you know. So uh, sumo is good, you know. We don't have uh, big remittances, but our sumo, 30 wrestlers, I think, uh, remit lots of money back. Uh, to so it's a good, good. Um, Export and Asashoro is behaving himself very well now in Mongolia. He's a big businessman now. You know, owns a bank. My competition and uh, so uh, he changed his uh, territory a little bit. Um, um, we have three million people, so we cannot afford to send our workers here. But I think Japan, uh, after 20 years uh, of uh, assisting us transit from. Uh, uh, socialist state to uh, market uh, democracy now finally realized it's also uh, uh, could be a good place for business. That's why we signed the partnership agreement. Um, uh, KDDI has been in Mongolia for quite some time. Sumitomo has been uh, doing business and now um, the, the territory uh, which is 1.5 million square kilometers is the size of Western Europe. Can you imagine Western Europe? bordered with uh, Hungary and um, Czech. Czech Republic, etc. Only three million people live there. So uh, under the ground, what's underground is more interesting, I think, for uh, foreign investors. And uh, this is mining, and I understand very little in mining. But uh, we have uh, the largest untapped reserves, which are estimated to be 1.3 trillion dollars at the current value. The proven reserves of the um, natural, iron, natural resources. Coal, gold, uranium, the whole, um, uh, you can find anything in Mongolia. And, uh, the, the, uh, and whatever Japan, uh, countries like Japan produce, the input comes from Mongolia at this time. I mean, we are the uh, in the top five uh, countries that export copper. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can imagine the use of copper in our everyday life. Um, and uh, given the situation uh, with the energy, I think uh, uh, the renewable energy supplies from Mongolia could be interesting. And we are talking about new Silk Road um, that will connect the Eurasian continent from one end to the other. And that will also include Japan. And, uh, uh, and of course, you know, uh, the northeastern uh, Asia's uh, political situation uh, gives us opportunities. The, uh, because we are a country which has no standing disputes, political, sea, or land disputes with nobody. And that is. Uh, gives us hope that we can capitalize on the current situation and uh, uh, offer our um, mineral reserves. And of course, there is a, 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 a 
certain aspects in terms of doing business. And that's why we need a little bit more stability, political uh, stability, but also predictability of the policies. And that's where we work. I mean, who could predict in 2012 that I will lose in the elections? You know? We were growing 17%, the highest growth on this planet. And then Mongolians decided not to elect me or my party. Now we're growing 7%. And I say, I'm sorry. We probably will grow 5%. You should come back? Well, um, maybe not. Maybe they need to ask me now. Um, uh, I brought some uh, annual reports of my company to do certain uh, PR and marketing. So if anybody is interested to learn about Mongolia, about the things we do and the opportunities we offer, please. Grab one. Gan, you said uh, you touched about the keyword uh, investment, foreign direct investment coming from the other country into a uh, targeted country. The most important, at least for the private sector, the predictivity, predictability, uh, or foreseeable future uh, regulations or uh, infrastructure 10 years from now, if it's a kind of foreseen. The private sector executive do not need to hesitate to invest because he or she can calculate what's going on, investment and return. But if uh, regulations or any of the infrastructure is not stable, then probably private sector executive hesitate to invest. In this perspective, uh, you said the instability a little bit. So how you are going to your country is going to improve and maybe uh, give more comfort for the investors into Mongolia? Well, uh, I, when I said um, predictability, and uh, that, that, that means, of course, you know, uh, on the other hand, there is volatility. And uh, the volatility is external. The situation with Russia and you know, on the sanctions because oh, okay. of, of the issues of Ukraine, mm -hmm. or because the slowdown in China. And, uh, um, you know, uh, it is a matter that the whole world uh, is watching and is affected by these developments. But uh, because we have only two neighbors, uh, uh, we need to try to do our best at least to try, you know, uh, to manage our country, our economy in this new normal. And the normal is volatility. And we need to be careful uh, because we are the uh, 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 commodities exporter. We export uh, minerals, and minerals feed the global economic growth. And then when that economy is, economic growth slows down, there is less demand, the prices fall, and, um, and all of a sudden, you know, we lose our top spot as a coal exporter to China, and lose it to Russia, uh, to Australia, etc. And, um, uh, and for that, you know, um, because I'm in the financial services sector, we try to talk about uh, diversification, about creating and accumulating wealth in our sovereign wealth fund mm -hmm. in the good times so that we can manage this volatility better and uh, try to manage the landing mm -hmm. so that we land uh, uh, software. Uh, but, and, and, and it doesn't work because the good news is that, of course, we are a democratic country. Mm -hmm. And whenever there is a change in the power, I still can go around and market my country. Uh, and uh, the, in terms of general direction, you know, the country doesn't change. And if there is even huge uh, populists that win, mm -hmm. which is the case today, uh, still, there are systems, checks and balances to keep the country on track. Okay. Um, how do you think the, the Thailand is uh, one of the specific country from viewpoint of Japanese uh, private sector? Uh, Thailand has been the country where the Japanese executive do not, did not need to worry about investment. Rather positive, uh, uh, the cash coming from uh, Tokyo to Bangkok. Uh, that has been, uh, I think, uh, history. And still, even in the military government at this time, but the private sector still do not worry about Thailand. And how do you think that why Thailand has been so successful in a perception, maybe uh, both sides, from, from uh, Dr. Bachala, but also from the two gentlemen, how do you see? Because such successful uh, state, uh, let's say, uh, kind of uh, reputation of the country is the key 
for the country to grow for the future? Well, uh, my, uh, of course, we have been seeing how Thailand has evolved over the last, uh, you know, three decades. You know, one thing which has remained constant is it has always remained an investment-friendly country. No change of regime has ever affected. Of course, there are some surprises at times, like once there was a you know, law that was uh, enacted or a regulation that was introduced against the, um, you know, against the ownership represented by the lawyers, what do you call that? Uh, there was a short phase which mm. sort of almost shook all the investors, but otherwise, people feel that uh, you know it's a it's a country f highly spiritual. People are good, down to earth, very respectful. Mm. They appreciate. I don't think there are major uh, events that one would like to think which disrupts business. And I think genuinely the administration, the bureaucracy, and all the ruling forces, they appreciate mm -hmm. FDI. Oh. There is no, there is no uh, prejudice. Mm -hmm. Do you see any uh, hint from uh, Thailand history to make uh, Nepal growing rapid for the future? Well, Jap Thailand has always been uh, one of the closest uh, you know, country in the world to Nepal for many reasons. Historically, it was monarchy, and then, of course, uh, the Lumbini, the Buddha. You know, Nepal, Nepal uh, uh, first international flight of Nepal Airlines, which has not been doing too well, was to Bangkok and vice versa. I think Thai International started flying to Nepal. That was for one of the one or two inter mm -hmm. first international flights. So people to people level, you not. Know, medical uh, tourism and you know so so i think thailand will always stand by nepal no question about it it's up to us it's the nepalese who have to prepare do the groundwork to present the right kind of business opportunities right kind of products which the, uh, the which 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 is uh, you know desired by the thai consumers mm -hmm. there is always going to be little bit of an edge when it comes to Nepalese and Nepalese product in the minds of the Thai people. Mm. I don't know whether I'm right. Yeah, the, uh, as I said, the China as a big emerging country, they enjoyed foreign direct investment and they grew a GDP according to that kind of growth of uh, foreign direct investment. But uh, just recently, uh, foreign investors started to worry about uh, further investment into China and some uh, investment is redirecting to other Asian countries. So uh, maybe uh, we may have a hint the how to attract uh, from, uh, from investor viewpoint uh, what is important, uh, what is uh, most strategically important uh, to be attractive target uh, investment uh, arena. The maybe Dr. Bachala, you have some suggestions the, because Thailand has been so co successful continuously, not only one year, two years, but uh, long years, uh, to be so much attractive uh, target country. Thank you. Well, I try to talk about Thailand less and less because we are here for frontier market, but we not know Thailand very well. Thank you for that. Um, one, one of the things when I was with the government, and I'm, I'm serving for governments for, for, for prime ministers, one thing when I was in charge of the trade is that we try to uh, tell the investors or the business partners who come to Thailand on two things. First, we use the word dual track. Dual track is like a person has stand to, on two legs, left and right. Of course, all the investment must go to China because China is 1.8 billion people. I mean, there's only two countries in the world which has people more than 1 billion, which is only India, 1.2, and 1.8 is China. That's it. So you sell, you sell a, a can of coke to China. One, one person buy one can. That's 1.8 billion can a day. I mean, there's no, no, no much to compete. That's why country, uh, smaller country must form a, like a corporation like ASEAN. We also have another group called BIMSTEC. BIMSTEC also stands for Bangladesh, B-I-M-S-T-E-C. Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Thailand, um, Sri, Lanka. Sri Lanka Economic Corporation. Those also another group uh, which is formed to strengthen 
the negotiation power, strengthen the potentials. Dual track means uh, China on one leg, but you don't want to put everything on one leg. You need two legs. So another leg, choose someone. Can be Thailand, can be Nepal, can be Mongolia, can be any country which you think it will be good. At that time, because of ASEAN, so we say, one leg on China, one leg, one leg on ASEAN, but in a friendly way, because um, we are not competing. Uh, actually, China investment is for domestic consumption, and non-China investment would be somewhere else. So that is the thing we are trying to, to put. And, um, but one thing, um, as Bino say, and also we, I'm, I'm sure most of us here share, uh, I, I think we being a Buddhist, doesn't have to be focusing on rites and rituals and ceremony, but the, the way of thinking, the philosophy that we absorb by, by the Lord Buddha make us a little bit more balanced, more moderate, and more, I don't want to say less greed, but can be more like a, you, you, you function yourself in an in a appropriate way. Of course, uh, uh, that is the thing we, we like to share. And sometimes when I speak in European countries or I speak in other places, it doesn't have necessarily to be only Buddhism because it's about the philosophy that we learn from religion. So it can be, I use the word interfaith, interfaith, which also can link. And when Asia has problem, one thing I just also mentioned to Dr. Hori last night uh, at his home, um, I, I'm, we are going to organize one uh, conference next year in Bangkok. It's a, it's a conference which I co-share, uh, called Horasis. Horasis is run by a German, co um, and I have been co-share with him. Then we're going to bring Horasis to Asia next, next, next year. I have asked Dr. Hori uh, to become co-share of this event. One of the e topics that I like to put in is the word called interfaith. I think religion and the way of thinking that we learn from the religion can help solve the problem at least to some certain extent. We have dispute, we have disagreement, sure. I mean, how can you don't have that when you work and we have, you have different op opinion? I think it's fairly healthy to have discussion like that. And don't forget that your root can teach you something that you learn from. So I, I think those, those things are the success or the reason that uh, we try to maintain our, our status. All right. Uh, I think uh, the, not only just uh, limiting our countries, but the uh, frontier market as a kind of whole, uh, we may a uh, little bit mention about how the audience should understand the, what's the attractiveness, what's the future of uh, frontier market as a whole. Well, I, once again, uh, I would like to reiterate that you cannot generalize. I mean, you know, when you talk of the frontier markets, you're talking One, one does not fit all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> From South Asia to Africa to Middle East to Latin America, all these countries embody, you know, their own intrinsic strengths and weaknesses, including the political environment. But we work in, I was just looking at the list, we work in nine of these countries. And my uh, take is that certainly, relatively speaking, these countries have a much more positive political mindset. Political problem may be there, but they love FDI, they love foreign investment. They're prepared to walk that extra mile. Level of corruption is far lesser. And even if it's there, it doesn't you know, necessarily impact you as a foreign investor. Fairly friendly, uh, let's say, labor laws. OK, very, very sustainable. and. Often, I mean, you know, you would find that these countries do offer some very unique investment packages. For instance, I'd like to give you the example. We're setting up an instant food, uh, instant noodle making plant, ramen, as you call it, in Japan, in Serbia, in Belgrade. You know, Serbia is a country which is likely to become a part of EU soon, but it is still not. Okay? It's part of the uh, erstwhile Yugoslavia. It has a trading, free trade agreement with Russia as well as with the EU. Mm -hmm. So it's a unique kind of a proposition, okay? You can, we can, uh, I can give many similar examples of these countries who are going that extra mile. I mean, so far, the LDCs are concerned. Again, you know, it, you need to decide yourself in your mind. Like, we've grown 
from LDCs, okay? LDCs which are trying to graduate to frontiers. You know, I always say that there are also opportunities, the way it all depends on how you look at it, okay? How much you can handle it. Because if you are able to manage the environment, which is not difficult, if you work with the local partners, if you work with the right set of people, with the processes, with the know-how, with the cheap capital that you can bring in, you can create wonders. You know, I've seen in my whole entire career, there are two types of investors. A are institutional investors whose processes are highly sort of standardized. You know, even if they want to go to emerging markets, or, or let's say list of real DCs, or to even frontiers, many of the criteria which are specified by their policy board or governing board won't, won't do it. So they are going to be looking for Singapore and Hong Kong and, you know, perhaps uh, Japan or Korea, you know. There would no way they will go to the country risks are too high as defined. To people like us, those are the markets which, are, which have an advantage. And we have always advocated that such countries, such companies, such institutions, and there are many of them in Japan. Okay. And, that's, and I'm, since our audience is Japan and through your, this forum, I like to spread this message out. They are best poised to work with entrepreneurial enterprises to go to frontier markets, to go to the LDCs, using their know-how, their ch cheap capital. Okay. Okay? That's the way to go. All right. Thank you. The Gan, the, may I invite you? Maybe not only uh, Mongolia, but the overall frontier market. You have any uh, comment, advices, wishes? Well, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the point that I wanted to uh, make uh, in my previous intervention was um, come in when there is a crisis. Yeah. Right now, things are selling for cheap. Uh, the previous, uh, the pioneers of Japanese investment in a country like Mongolia, like uh, uh, Sawada-san, who operates a uh, uh, touristic company. He bought a bank for $10 million. Now it's worth $1 billion in only 10 years. Uh, KDDI operates the largest uh, Mobicom, uh, mobile phone company since uh, 1994 and uh, they've done wonders. It's the uh, uh, single largest mobile operator. So first comer advantage is there in different industries. As I said, there is $1.3 trillion underground proven reserves of everything that countries such as Japan need. Um, somebody needs to dig them out uh, in a most efficient manner and export, sell it to China or, or sell it to uh, the rest of uh, the uh, industrialized so world. So encouragement to come in? Yes, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, and the risk is uh, uh, you end up in a country which is going to be, on a per capita basis, the richest country in the world. I mean, because it's three million people, it's easy uh, with the, uh, the mineral resources and the land mass that we possess, it's easy, within my lifetime, I'm an optimist, to make it real wolf economy of uh, yeah, Eurasia. Because, because uh, 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 Thailand is a tiger economy, and uh, we talk about tigers, miracle. But then uh, there is not such a notion for a landlocked country with very few people. Uh, how do you ma make it uh, a developed nation in one generation? Right. So for me, this is the wolf. And the wolf will be based on, you know, the initial wealth will come from uh, mineral resources, but we need to diversify into education, into uh, health, and become become a hub, financial hub for Asia in this time mm. zone. Maybe just to support your comment, the GDP per capita in Thailand is uh, about six thousand uh, dollar, and currently in Mongolia it's already over four thousand yeah, because of num number of uh, people are a little bit uh, small, only three million people. So divided by such a natural resources. So it's a kind of a unique situation in Mongolia. It grew from $300 in uh, less than uh, 15 years to 4000 And of course, the current government did everything to distract the value. All right. But uh, hopefully next year we get into power and uh, um, we'll fix the situation again okay. and grow nominally at, again, 33% per annum. It was 33% per annum on a nominal basis in uh, 19, 2011, right. the highest. Okay, so uh, I'd like to take a question now. Uh, then we get into a kind of interest from the audience. Then we can uh, further discuss when it is uh, interesting. 
So any uh, questions from the audience? Please. Microphone, please. I have a question about the employee market. Um, I'm Japanese, but I'm interested in to move on as a market, uh, as an employee. And in, in this case, what kind of people, what kind of expertise are you expecting from Japanese uh, people, uh, for example, in engineering or some finance? What kind of people do you expecting from Japanese? Um, well, for the past t 20, 30 years, that we start the industrial development with Japan is technology. Um, then the know-how that Japanese produce uh, it and bring it here. Um, I think now ASEAN is in the needs for, I, I guess for Japan now when we look at it, is the new kind of technology. No longer heavy industry, no longer automotive. That's still on, but it's not the things uh, that we are looking with potential anymore. Uh, I think IT, I think renewable energy, nanotechnology, those kind of things which uh, Japanese still ex excellent uh, are the things which uh, we're looking into. Also, because of uh, my observation, I don't know, uh, nothing wrong with being an aging society. Thailand, in a few years, we will have 15% uh, of uh, 60 plus years old population. I think it's happening everywhere. So how to take care of the, uh, the senior people. And yet again, it opens up a new market, a new opportunity. I, I noticed when I was jogging in the morning today, some of the advertising before 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. then becomes normal program. Before 6 a.m., most of the shop channel, most of the advertising commercials are for the senior people. And that compared to, like even a year before, it's a lot more. So I think, uh, there's a know-how or there's a, a business for the service. Uh, now, Japan Hospital needs more nurses and nurses assistants, which is, of course, Japanese uh, nationals alone are not enough. So there are importation of, uh, uh, of the non-Japanese Thai uh, nurses being ones uh, to come here to take care of the patients or the, uh, the clients here. I think now uh, the way to look back for Japanese to grow outside, uh, which is your uh, Prime Minister Sabe's policy, is uh, ASEAN now don't look at it as a one, look at it as a, as a 10 countries. In, uh, also Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, Indonesia, and Brunei, that's as ASEAN six, the first six. Then we have four more becoming 10. The four more is called CLMV, is Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Vietnam, those are still frontier markets, frontier economies, but combining 10 all together, ASEAN has 700 million people and more than 3.5 trillion US dollars. So that gives you an opportunity that uh, for one investment, uh, you have access to the free market uh, for 700 million people. And also Japan is one of the three countries that ASEAN uh, encompass uh, with close a relationship is called ASEAN plus three, Japan, Korea, China. That becomes always uh, invited as an ASEAN meeting. Then we extend it further to, uh, to also uh, ASEAN plus six. Now we have uh, uh, India, uh, Australia, New Zealand. So those all together have the, uh, all together the, the, the meeting, not only for economic cooperation, but now in all aspects, cultural, people exchange, uh, education, and so on. So I think, uh, getting back to your, your, your question, I think nanotechnology is one, uh, new IT, and also perhaps uh, energy, renewable energy are also very important, and good potentials to everyone. The question was uh, interesting. Uh, the, what kind of assistance do you expect from Japan? No, his question was what kind of people you expect from Japan? <laughs> so it's a very typical, uh, uh, question because uh, we value people mm -hmm. and we try to transfer, we try to send uh, good people like uh, engineers or, en or scientists. And then those people make business together with country people and we do not suck up the money but just tr try to transfer the knowledge from Japan to those countries. We are very proud of what Japan is doing. In this sense, they have what kind of people <laughs> you expect from Japan, Gan? 
Well, uh, I think uh, the most important aspect is uh, people with Can you uh, use your mic, hearts, please? Your mic. With, uh, who want, who, ambitious people who want to uh, see things in a, from a different perspective, do things differently than the regular crowd in uh, Japan, and succeed in life. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, given certain attributes such as these, uh, softer attributes, I think one can succeed anywhere. And I think Mongolia and uh, other countries uh, such as ours offer a very good springboard to uh, someone who's young, ambitious, bold, and uh, wants to try out new things and uh, become a bridge between the two nations. And I think, um, you know, me working with, uh, you know, with the school where, uh, and bringing all sorts of uh, expertise uh, in the form of uh, professors and teachers is important because we want to learn and uh, leapfrog mm -hmm. the development uh, of uh, industrialized nations and do it uh, in a, you know, leapfrogging, meaning maybe in a decade, do th some things that were done 100 years in other countries. And you know, the teachers is uh, uh, the most gratifying and uh, I think it's the best uh, profession one can have to teach other people what you have learned and experienced in life. And of course, you know, uh, you can come and um, uh, find a job and lead a very happy life. Yeah, we was talking about Buddhism, and I think uh, happiness is one aspect that we don't talk about uh, on this kind of official events. But we all want to be happy. Okay. No. Maybe you have a quick comment on. Yeah. Well, um, to supplement the gun, I think it's the it's the commitment to your work and the teamwork. Okay, and discipline. I think these are the three words I think comes to my mind when I think of Japanese people. Okay, and these three are integral part for, of putting together whether a nation or a successful enterprise. So anyone who can promote these qualities, I think will go, will go a long way in, in being successful in that environment. I mean, I think these are the areas where Japanese can play a great role. Okay. All right, next questions, please, in the front row. Um, yes, for, a, uh, for globally expanding uh, new startup companies in Asia, what would be the... Uh, maybe a uh, switch on the microphone. Oh, um, Ko Fuji from Makaira. Um, what, uh, what is the typical global strategy for an Asian successful company? Um, if this were a U.S. Silicon Valley company, they would usually go to an English-speaking European country and then come into Asia via Singapore or Hong Kong and, you know, expand into China and maybe Japan would be last. So, so if you were starting from Bangkok or, you know, starting from Kuala Lumpur, um, what would be the typical global expansion strategy? Well, uh, may I? Yes, please. Well, it depends on uh, what kind of a company, yeah. what kind of an investor. To me, I, go, I like to go to the country which has huge problems. <laughs> because I, that's where I see opportunity. And less, and, and, uh, and sort of a more entry barrier to my competition. I went to Sri Lanka at a time when six aircrafts were bombed in Colombo Airport. And the investment that I made there is the best investment I've made ever in my life. Same applies to, you know, I mean, I can give many other examples. Let, let me add to be note. Um, that is turning crisis into opportunities. I agree, I agree. Um, I just add one more thing, because also your question about people. Um, I like to, well, not me, but in, in like m most people would like to work with people they are happy with. You talk about happy. We are, when you're not happy with your partners, you don't want to do it. Yeah. It's just like, I don't feel like doing it. Unless it's very profitable, maybe you have to close one eye and try to do it. But the perfect startup would be looking for a good partner, um, looking for something you don't have. Maybe something which uh, can be uh, put, putting you into full, full potential. We talk about Japanese technology, and Japanese also need a, a partner in the region that can help them expand. So those, those are the things you are seeking for something you, you, are, you, you are missing. So that, that's one thing. And again, uh, the second part would be 
look maybe just like marriage. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, looking for some, uh, some, some, some party or some partnership or some new business that can help you to grow together. That is also uh, why Thailand and Japan, as here they say, why it goes so well. Because the mentality, the similarity are here. We look for partner for long term. We are looking for not only profit, because uh, Buddhism actually, uh, it doesn't give us the, the, you know, the, the attitude of maximizing profit, which is, which is even a corporate culture. But now, I think it's utilization of profit is also very important. That's why the similarity, not only for, for the way of thinking or mentality, but also perhaps uh, the similarity among ASEANs, Asians, and also uh, the, uh, the geographical, uh, which is also give us um, uh, the, the less difficult um, um, reasons uh, to, to do business together. Okay. So let's take another question quickly. Actually, could you use the mic? Yeah. Yes. Um, my question is, how would you consider the social capital market in your region? Uh, would you consider them also emerging? And how does it affect the economic growth of your region? Uh, well, we talk about CSR, corporate social responsibility. It used to be a part of the options. Now it's compulsory, it's a must. And I think, uh, again, I just talk about utilization of profit. It's no longer maximization of profit. Maximization means you try to make as much money as you can, no matter what. Now it's not. It has to be, you know, thinking of something else you just mentioned. Uh, how can you support uh, the, uh, the place you belong to, ambience? Like if you have a factory in this uh, village, then you make sure you employ the, the people in the locals. You support the enhancement of education. And actually, uh, education is a word we are not talking too much in this uh, room, not yet, because, it's the, because of the topic is about frontier market. But education is a long-term success reason for anything. Unless you have good education, then it's very, very difficult to continue sustainability. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, go, go ahead. I, uh, I come from a microfinance background, and um, I think uh, 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 I, uh, I got very disappointed, you know, when uh, I did this for over uh, a decade. And, you know, uh, money is the last piece of the equation. And I think education, uh, good governance, uh, good um, social network, uh, safety nets, and um, health access to universal health is, are the uh, important aspects. But it's, it's most of the uh, cases, it's done by the governments. What can a private sector do? So, you know, if you look uh, ac uh, across uh, our investments, uh, uh, we are trying to take care, the private sector led, you know, leads the way in terms of offering the best quality uh, health care. I mean, if we used to go to Korea, Japan, and Thailand to get the uh, uh, world standard services, now the Bumrungrad came to Mongolia. So we try to get not just capital, but we try to get people, and we try to get the technology know, uh, and expertise. And if it comes with a, an open heart, it's even better. You know, the, uh, and uh, I think um, the, in terms of social um, corporate responsibility, um, it's a must. It's a must, and uh, the transition uh, that we're making is uh, not just economic leapfrogging. It is uh, mindset leapfrogging. It is uh, leapfrogging of uh, 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 you know of all the different norms and standards that were tested and now became regulated uh, uh, in these uh, developing countries. It is becoming a, just a regular uh, standard from day one in countries such as uh, Mongolia. So. We, this is a reality. Please. Well, I completely agree with uh, my co-panelists. You know, it's no longer a matter of choice. As a matter of fact, it's not even charity, I would say. You know, the social capital, or let's say the goodwill that you generate because of your social endeavors, you call it CSR or whatever, is far more powerful 
than how much of wealth you're generating or your balance sheet is generating. Look at it today. I mean, there is a, I think companies all over the world are respected for what they are giving much more than what they are making. I'm not saying it's not important for company to remain positive, profitable, but it's, I think the people judge the endeavors by the, from the way, what are you giving back to the society in times of need? Little bit about uh, the micro finance analogy presented by GAN. You know, I mean, we are involved in impact uh, business. You know, we've created a, we call it a Nepal social business in association with Professor Mohammed Yunus, the one who had initially started the microfinance. He introduced the second breed of uh, micro business. Micro business is just about $700 per ticket generally. And social business is more than $30,000. Actually, you pick up an entrepreneur with a good idea, which has a social impact. You fund that individual, help incubate, help run the business. I think that's a great form of uh, social generating social capital. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't get disheartened, my dear friend. You know, I would <laughs> encourage my, you know, to, to, to Take the, take, make the whole initiative a little bit more broader and take it to the next level. OK. So, uh, so. I just, uh, just make one small point. I, uh, I uh, took the uh, uh, motto, Investor Nation. I think instead of trying to give small credits uh, and charge interest uh, and uh, have investors from America, Europe, and Japan and make them triple digit returns in the last 15 years, we now saying, OK, 3 million Mongolians, buy our shares, $10, $100, whatever. Let me work to make you uh, a, a, a richer person, and you can enjoy life. So uh, this is uh, um, the next level of uh, uh, microfinancing that uh, I'm trying to cope with. We take just a quickly last question, maybe a last law. Thank you. Good day all. My name is Daniel Chimuze. I'm from Nigeria, uh, a Globus full-time MBA candidate. My question goes more precisely to the Mongolian. I have made a little research here on my phone. I want to ask you, um, for people, you're encouraging people from Japan or maybe other parts of Asia to come to Mongolia or, the, or Thailand. What are your plans like to cover issues of uh, language barrier? Because I discover you don't, the, your official language here does not show English. For someone like me, I'm a risk taker, for instance, assuming I want to come to Asia after my MBA, go to any other Asian country, rather, after my MBA to start up a business. Like, I have very great interest in education and innovation. So w how would you help uh, us to soft land, those who have such kind of vision or dream? Thank you. Well. I, uh, I think we can take one more question, and then, uh, <laughs> and then we will all make a, a final statement, no? I'm sorry to do your job. <laughs> I will. Maybe uh, you can talk offline yes, to help yes, him yes. around. <laughs> there was two more hands here, maybe. Uh, OK. Um, uh, the, the, uh, we like to be question. very quick. The last one, please. Uh, this one will be not, sir. Afternoon, sir. So they say the success of any business is to know something that nobody else knows. How true is that? Because you are a role model for all us. So just wanted to know your thoughts. Well, I don't know whether uh, it's about knowing something nobody knows. But probably it's doing differently, you know? Knowing this, coming across the same opportunity in the same environment, but finding a way of doing it differently. I think there is a way, there is always a solution to a problem. Um, find this book uh, by Peter Thiel, yes. Zero to One. This just tells you, you know, you can uh, grow business from uh, existing business, uh, from one to five, on a scale to 10, you can do it excellently. But the biggest, uh, the entrepreneurs are defined uh, uh, by, uh, to me, by this book, you know. You find something that doesn't exist and take it from zero to the first level. And that's where you make uh, the difference. 
and uh, leave a legacy. And to your point, I think English is pretty universal, no? Uh, although it's not in the constitution of the country, uh, it is mandatory. If you speak Russian, it's better. If you speak Chinese, perfect. Mm -hmm. And if you understand Japanese, welcome to Mongolia. We need people who understand this culture. Okay. Uh, I'm very sorry that we need to squeeze the last five minutes because uh, uh, because I like to show uh, one five minutes uh, video. Uh, f four years plus a uh, year ago, uh, Japan suffered from a big earthquake in east pa eastern part of uh, Japan. This year in April, Nipah uh, suffered uh, the big earthquake you have seen on the TV news. Actually, uh, the, he's uh, really leading the recovery efforts of uh, Nepal from earthquake. So please have watch on this video. Thank you very much. Nepal has been hit with its worst earthquake in decades. After a quake toppled temples that stood for centuries. Thousands homeless and many more still unaccounted for tonight after the worst disaster Nepal has seen in nearly a century. But it is now a scene of almost indescribable horror. On 25th April 2015, a devastating 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Nepal. 14 out of 75 districts were severely affected. According to government reports, the earthquake claimed more than 8,500 lives and directly affected above 8 million people. Chaudhary Foundation, the philanthropic arm of Chaudhary Group CG, and one of its corporate social responsibility CSR initiatives immediately deployed its team for earthquake relief and recovery. As an immediate response initiative, relief camps were conducted at five Chaudhary Group education schools located in Kathmandu Valley. Food, water, and medical relief were distributed to hundreds of people in association with various community-based organizations. Using CG distribution and logistics network, relief aids were distributed directly to nine different districts. At present, we are conducting post-disaster management where the main focus is on reconstruction and rehabilitation to reduce the impact of future hazards by building back better. Chaudhary Foundation has pledged 2.5 million US dollars for relief aid, school restoration, and transitional shelters. It aims to restore more than 100 community primary schools in 14 highly affected districts. It also aims to build 10 permanent schools for skill development and trainings, so that the children, our future generation, will not be deprived of their fundamental right to education. <laughs> सरकेर असुरक्षित भएर विद्यार्थी बसोबासको लागि उपयुक्त छैन भूकम्प पश्चात पहिलो हामीलाई सहयोग गर्ने भनेको सिजी फाउन्डेसन नै र चौधरी ग्रुपले देखाएको सहयोग प्रति प्रदान गरेको सहयोग प्रति हामीलाई प्रकट गरेको सहानुभूति प्रति हामी विद्यालय परिवार फेरि पनि म चाहिँ आभारी व्यक्त गर्न चाहन्छु यो क्लास भनि सकेपछि हामीलाई एकदम सजिलो भएको छ गर्मी छैन हावा पानी नि ठिक छ Chaudhary Foundation pledges to construct 10,000 transitional shelters and has aimed to build 3,000 by November 2015. Dan 
अरे देरे सुविधा सा हमने बच्चा रोले बनो परिवार रोले देरे सही लो बेटा जिंदा हम बड़ी नालागने अब ये तीर से पारी के टम्मे ऐडे हमने बस सबने चाहिए ना अब ये टीएस में तो आवाज़ से राय रखता है ऐडे सी टल उनसे देरे सही लो सी टल उनसे घर में लोकल पीपल हैव बीन रिसीविंग ट्रेनिंग एंड ओरिएंटेशन टू कंस्ट्रक्ट दिस हाउस Chaudhary Foundation is immensely grateful to its relief partners, PwC India and Seeds India. Chaudhary Group bears all overhead costs so that fund for transitional shelters and schools are utilized for the sole purpose of providing relief and recovery. Committed to rebuilding our nation, Chaudhary Foundation. I'm most grateful uh, to the organizers, Mr. Hiratyasan, for giving us the opportunity. In fact, I requested my friend, uh, Mr. Hori, to give us a moment for us to share uh, a little bit about what is happening in Nepal. You know, what you've seen here is probably the tip of an iceberg. 700,000 homes down, 30,000 schools unusable. I mean, I'm not even talking about the physical infrastructure or the traditional heritage, you know, the, uh, the monuments, etc. Earthquake, which you are so used to, but you're so well organized, unlike Nepal, continued for months. It has left the economy to a large extent crippled. The tourism has gone down to the extent of 50%, you know. So there are hosts of issues which we are surrounded by. I know that there is tremendous goodwill all over the world, particularly in Japan. And we've been, you all have been very, very supportive, you know, one way or other. Nepal has the opportunity either to emerge as a country, as it happened in case of Gujarat and China when big earthquakes stuck, or it had also has the danger of becoming something like Haiti. Money is not enough. The capacity to absorb health is the key thing. And that's what we learned in the process of creating this system. I mean, before, before we would have normally given our contribution to the Prime Minister's Fund. But Nepal is going through a phase of political transition. The mm -hmm. focus is on constitution writing. Mm -hmm. The priorities are different. Four and a half billion dollars has been committed by international community to support Nepal, but not even a dollar has been used. Oh I, wherever I go, wherever I go, anywhere in the world, I come across people, we help Nepal. You know, people say with a sigh of happiness and then responsibility, but I don't know where the money is going. I mean, how well they are being channelized. So I think any, any country, you know, which is going through this kind of a situation needs to create platforms which are viable and which helps people to have their support go where it is aimed at. And, at, and timely. Of course, we have placed and we are, we've created a system. We are going to deliver 10,000 of those little homes you saw and hundreds of schools. Many of our international partners like Alibaba, Tata Group, Sapurji, LG, they've all come forward. They all want to work. I'm not here to ask for anything. I'm just, my message is this is the time Nepal needs you more than anything else. If nothing else, Joe, just go and travel to Nepal and keep the morale of the Nepalese small micro-businesses on the trekking routes of Annapurna, which the Japanese love, the international community love, hi. Okay. This is the time when we need to all collectively come together and ensure that it does not land up becoming another Haiti. I think uh, 
the, the European country is now suffering from refugees and acceptance of such from Syria and so on. I think uh, we in Asia, we have a different situation. The, we do not want to have a refugees of any of Asian countries. The, every nation, every people in each of Asian countries, they should love their own country and we help each other. So that should be an Asian spirit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Hirate. Thank you, all panelists.